All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Gisela Carbonell. I am the curator here at the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rollins College in Winter Park. And tonight we have two special guests um, who will be talking about a very interesting topic. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, I want to remind everyone that the museum is open, so you can come and visit us and visit our exhibitions. And for more information or to reserve tickets, free tickets to the museum, please visit us at uh, rollins.edu slash cfam. So tonight we have uh, with us Isaac Gores and Dr. Brenda Lee Santiago Narvaez, who are going to be giving a presentation titled, I hope I say this right, Chemotaxis and Coach Neil, Microbial Insights into the Permanent Collection. So I hope we have lots of scientists, artists, and historians joining us tonight. Our first speaker, Isaac Boris, is a recent Rollins graduate who double majored in biochemistry, molecular biology, and art history, and also did a minor in studio art. His primary research interests include microbial biodegradation of pigments and painted surfaces and the use of microbial isolation schemes to deduce the presence of specific organic red pigments in art objects. Additionally, Isaac was the Fred W. Hicks Curatorial Fellow during his senior year of undergraduate students. And I had him as a great colleague here in the museum. And uh, he guest curated the exhibition Path to Paradise, the artistic legacy of Dante's Divine Comedy, an exhibition which is currently on view at the museum and uh, will be on view until August 29th. This fall, Isaac will begin studying for a master's of uh, science in biology with a specialization in microbiology at Radboud University in the Netherlands. And we'll be cheering him on from the Rollins campus. Dr. Brenda Lee Santiago Narvaez is an oral microbiologist whose work focuses on the study of Streptococcus, um, the bacteria responsible for causing human dental cavities. Her studies focus, uh, uh, focus on understanding the microbes pathogenic behavior uh, specifically its ability to form biofilms. Uh, she's an expert in topics related to microbiology and immunology. Some areas of interest are the bi microbiome, microbial pathogenesis, microbial physiology, and microbe host interactions. Dr. Santiago is from Puerto Rico. She obtained her bachelor's in biology from the University of Puerto Rico, Maya West. She moved to Rochester, New York, and attended the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry, where she completed both a master's and a PhD in microbiology and immunology. She teaches courses on general biology, introductory microbiology, microbial physiology, microbial genetics, and a special topics course on extremophilic bacteria. She also teaches a non-major uh, course titled The Good, the Bad, and the Invisible, where students explore the benefits of microorganisms and their impacts on human life. In this presentation tonight, before I hand it off to you, uh, Dr. Santiago, and to you, Isaac, uh, is a great example of the kind of interdisciplinary collaborations uh, that we have here at Rollins and the amazing projects across fields that we are able to do with the objects from our collection, scientists like uh, Dr. Santiago and scientists slash art historians slash artists like Isaac. So welcome both of you and I'm going to turn it over to you. If you have questions uh, for all of, uh, of you watching, if you have questions or comments, put them in the comment box and we'll get to those at the end of their presentation so we can have a conversation. Thank you. All right. Well, <clears throat> welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for having us uh, here tonight to talk a little bit about our research. Um, what I'm going to do right now is just give a quick background on how this research came to be, uh, what sort of support system we have at Rollins that allows students like Isaac to pursue his uh, interests, especially those of interdisciplinary nature, and also give a very brief background on why am I interested in this type of work and why is it relevant to someone like me who is a, a microbiologist uh, by training. So at Rollins, we have a, a wonderful program called the Student Faculty Collaborative Scholarship Program, which is an in-house funded competitive program where students 
get the chance to write proposals um, on areas of interest of their own, uh, whether it's related to the faculty mentor that they work with, or in the case of Isaac, this was his, entirely his original uh, project, his original idea. Uh, and students get the chance to get funding and to work side by side with us one on one. Uh, multiple times a week for anywhere between six to 10 weeks about during the summer. So this gives uh, students really the opportunity to do hands-on research with us side by side. Uh, and it's really an, an incredible opportunity, not only for the students, but for me uh, as someone as a mentor that gets to work with the students one-on-one -on -one, uh, and develop projects, right? And troubleshoot the work that we're doing. So uh, Isaac, uh, as a student was very interested in combining both his interest in uh, art, art conservation, art history, and also his interest as someone who is trained as a biochemist and uh, with a little bit of interest there in microbiology. So he wanted to combine all those things together. And and really the, the work that he's going to talk to you about today is completely his original idea that I was lucky enough to support him in uh, and provide my expertise so that we can make this project uh, possible. Um, so to give you a very quick little background on, on what this project really is about and why do we care about it. Um, the field of microbiology has been around for a very, very long time. Uh, and our interest in microorganisms at the beginning was purely uh, focused on microbes that cause disease uh, because that was the one thing that we cared about at the time. We wanted to know why do microbes cause disease and especially which are the ones that are dangerous so we can avoid them or we can destroy them. But as time has gone by, we have learned a lot about the role that microbes play, not only in causing disease, but also in doing good things. So there's an entire area in microbiology called the microbiome, uh, which is basically an area of microbiology that studies the microorganisms that are in and on living things. Uh, and really, we want to ask the question, what microbes are there? Why are they there? And what are they doing if they're occupying that space? Uh, so this is kind of where the microbiome study area started. But the more we have studied the role of microbes, for example, in living things like plants, animals, and humans, more importantly, we have really discovered that the microbiome is not exclusive to living things. It also applies to inanimate objects. Uh, and here is where our understanding of microbes in uh, objects, you know, your desk, your computer, and in historical pieces of art, like the one that Isaac will talk to you about today, come into play. So there's an entire area of study in microbiology that is focused on the microbiome of things. And interestingly enough, what we've discovered is that just like microbes play a role in health and in disease in humans, microorganisms can also play a role, for example, in the conservation of a piece of art, as well as the deterioration of that piece of art. So the so microbes really are everywhere and they play a role in everything. So that's sort of a quick background on what is it that we, we started out with and, and where does this idea come from? So I'll let Isaac take over and I hope everyone can enjoy his presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Santiago. And I'm just going to assume that my mic is turned on. So please, someone stop me if it is not. But so hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. So my name is Isaac Gorris, and I graduated from Rollins College this May. So I'm a very recent graduate. And during my final year at Rollins, I had the privilege of working on this interdisciplinary project with Dr. Santiago Narvaez from um, the Rollins Department of Biology, as well as Dr. Pamela Branick, also from the Rollins Department of Biology, and Dr. James Patron from the Department of Chemistry. And our project uh, investigated the microbial flora of this uh, Flemish old master painting on the right of the slide. So the artwork of interest, Marcellus Kaufermann's attributed circa 1550 um, crucifixion with St. John, the Virgin Mary, and Mary Magdalene is held within the permanent collection of the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rollins College. Our investigation centered on the novel application of restrictive microbial isolation schemes to attempt to identify the presence of specific organic red pigments in this painting. So firstly, I just wanna back up for a second and take a moment to discuss technical art history 
which has been defined by the Yale University Library as the study of an art object through technical examination, including investigations into artists' techniques, tools, and materials to better understand the artist's process and the materiality of the work. Thus, our investigation into the microbiome of Kofferman's crucifixion is a technical art historical one. So by isolating microbes and assaying their behavior, our preliminary results suggested that Kofferman's used cochineal, a red pigment derived from scale insects that was a new product in Flanders in the mid 1500s. Technical art historical investigations can thus provide a wealth of information about art objects and their creation. So for example, if a particular material such as cochineal was used only after a certain time, technical art historical studies can effectively help to date an artwork. If other works were created using the same materials and techniques, they can also suggest attributions that may be plausible. So um, if another artist is known to use a particular pigment, um, it can also strengthen or um, refute attributions. So the, overall, they're very useful for understanding the context of an art object and its creation. Before we get into the science though, let's examine the art historical side of things. So styles of art are always appropriated and adapted from other artists. In the mid 1500s, Northern Europe, or after the artistic and cultural explosion of the Northern Renaissance, artists working in Europe pursued many stylistic avenues. Marcellus Kofferman's crucifixion demonstrates traditional inspiration drawn from Netherlandish old masters, such as Ambrosius Benson and Roger van der Weyden. Kofferman's crucifixion actually includes elements copied pretty exactly from van der Weyden's crucifixion triptych, created circa 1445. This altarpiece was completed approximately a century before the work at CPAM. And when you look at both paintings side by side, you can really see the specific details appropriated by Kofferman's in the creation of his later painting. So St. John is depicted in both paintings in the same stance. So he is the, um, the male figure uh, wearing a red robe and he's leaning down in both paintings to comfort the Virgin Mary. Additionally, both images include fortified castles and cities in the distance, and both follow the same general color scheme. However, note how Kaufermans on the right switched the location of the Virgin Mary, wearing the white hood and the blue robe, and Mary Magdalene, who holds a jar of ointment at the left of von der Weyden's painting while, crutching the, or while clutching the cross in Kaufermans. These clear compositional alterations indicate that Kaufermans was not just copying the crucifixion triptych, but instead adapting the work of an earlier master. Overall, this side-by-side -side comparison illustrates just how terribly the work attributed to Kaufermans was conserved, uh, which is unfortunate uh, overall, but beneficial for our investigation. And I'll get to that in a bit. So the triptych by van der Weyden is over a century older and it is in much better condition as it has undoubtedly been cleaned by conservators at the museum where, where it is held. And these specific details of Kaufermann's crucifixion demonstrate extensive art conservation concerns. On the left, the sky surrounding Jesus exhibits severe discoloration and modeling of the paint surface, both potentially evidence of microbial biofilm formation. On the right, the area next to Mary Magdalene's robes indicates deep gouging of the paint surface, which you can't really see um, in the detail, but it, it is very, um, very pitted. Um, in, in that region of the painting. And this is another aspect that could potentially indicate microbial art conservation concerns. The state of Kofferman's crucifixion suggests the painting has not undergone any conservation interventions, and it has not been conserved um, since entering CFAM's collection in 1957. The fact that Kofferman's crucifixion has likely never been cleaned using the solvents commonly employed by art conservators makes it a good choice for looking at the microbiome of painted surfaces, as the microbial communities on the painting have likely never been disturbed. Another reason that we selected the painting by Kaufermans is the fact that it has multiple patches of red or reddish brown color. In the mid 1500s, there were multiple pigments available to artists working in Flanders. These three colors from left to right, carmine red, dragon's blood red, and matter red, all contain organic or carbon-containing 
colorant molecules with their molecular structures displayed above each of the swatches. As I mentioned earlier, carmine red, also known as cochineal, is derived from Dactylopius caucus, a small scale insect that parasitizes certain species of cacti in Central America and Mexico. Once again, cochineal was a new world import to Flanders that had just become widely available in the mid 1500s. Dragon's blood red, on the other hand, had been used in Europe since antiquity, and it was extracted from the resin of a particular tree in Yemen. Matter red was extracted from the matter plant. So because each of these colorant molecules contain carbon skeletons, they can serve as a source of energy for bacteria and molds, which derive their energy from successive oxidation of organic compounds. In other colors, such as green and blue, most of the pigments are chemical salts. And previous research by Caselli and other authors in 2018 had established that different microbes may preferentially colonize painted surfaces. So for example, swabs sampled from dark brown and red colored areas um, on the recto of the 17th century easel painting by Carlo Benoni revealed colonization by Aspergillus species and Penicillium species molds, while swabs sampled from yellow and pink colored areas revealed colonization by Cladosporium species molds. We hoped to expand on this by seeing if differential colonization patterns could also be witnessed with bacteria. So this leads to our primary research questions. Firstly, Dr. Santiago and I wish to design and con conduct a restrictive isolation scheme using dry swabs from the surface of the painting. Then we wish to conduct microchemotaxis assays to help visualize bacterial movement in response to a pigment gradient. Essentially, what this means is that motile microbes will generally swarm towards food sources and compounds deemed beneficial, while swarming away from antibiotics and other compounds deemed harmful. In our experiment, we hypothesize that if a microbial isolate both grows on a specific pigment and move towards it, its presence on the painting could indicate the use of specific pigments by the artist. First, we selected 11 swabbing locations on the surface of the painting. Locations R1 through R7 represent areas with a red or reddish brown hue, while locations W1 through W3 represent areas with a white or beige hue. Our control swab, and that's represented by the zero, um, is on the exposed wooden support of the painting because this painting is um, oil paint on panel. Additionally, it was ensured that locations demonstrating potential evidence of microbial biodegradation, such as discoloration, modeling, and pitting of the paint surface were included in the final selections. Location W3, for example, is above one of the areas highlighted earlier. To collect the swabs, we gently rubbed uh, dry, sterile cotton swabs on each location for approximately 10 seconds in the Clive Gallery of CFAM. Then we deposited the swabs in sterile conical tubes and transported them across campus to the Bush Science Center. So once we reached Bush, we immediately inoculated uh, mineral salt medium plates with one of the swabs from each location. Mineral salt medium, or MSM, is a low nutrient, high salt content media that has been used for the isolation of bacillus species spore formers in oil paint warehouses by Fulpoto and other authors in 2016. And also another reason that we thought that this, um, that this medium would be a good one for isolating microbes from paintings is because it kind of mimicked the low nutrient, high salt content um, environment of the surface of an oil painting. Because I, as I discussed earlier, many of the other inorganic paints that are used by artists are uh, metallic salts suspended um, in, in the linseed oil for the oil paint. So our MSM only plates contained no carbon source and thus they were a negative control. So we did not expect to see any growth on the mineral salt medium only plates. The MSM plus C and MSM plus A plates on the other hand were supplemented with one millimolar concentrations of carminic acid and alizarin, the colorant molecules of cochineal and matter red respectively. For this part of the experiment, I had not yet successfully extracted cinnabarone from dragon's blood resin with Dr. Patron, uh, which is why there is no plate uh, 
used that was supplemented with dragon's blood red. Our inoculated plates were then left in the 37 degrees Celsius incubator and monitored for growth. After approximately two days, every um, MSM plus C plate exhibited growth shown on the left side of the slide representing location R6. And no growth was observed on the MSM only or MSM plus A plates. Next, we conducted microchemotaxis assays using control strains of E. coli and Bacillus subtilis. Once again, microchemotaxis assays are a simple way of quantifying bacterial movement in response to a chemical gradient. So the larger the column in the graph on the left, the more the microbe moved towards the pigment molecules. And we actually set this up using um, syringes full of the chemotaxis buffer, um, which doesn't contain any carbon compounds. It's just to help the microbes move in that, in that medium. But so we filled syringes with a predetermined amount of chemotaxis buffer. And then we um, suspended those in broth cultures of, of the bacteria uh, that, we, that we assayed for that. And then uh, we left them in the incubator for a predetermined amount of time and then took them out, uh, removed the syringe and immediately expelled that um, into a container, which we then used for serial dilution plating. So that is why uh, the y-axis of the graph on the left is colony forming units. So the, the higher the bar is, um, the, more, the more of the bacteria traveled up into the needle of the syringe. Um, and our preliminary results suggested that all three pigment molecules served as chemoattractants for both bacteria, both E. coli and Bacillus subtilis control strains. And I think the important thing to note here is that the green columns represent trials conducted with glucose rather than a pigment molecule. And all of the trials with pigments represent stronger chemotactic responses than glucose, which was a known um, chemoattractant for both of these bacteria, both E. coli and Bacillus subtilis. So this part of the experiment really reassured to us that presumably a wide variety of bacteria have the potential to both move towards and then potentially metabolize uh, these pigment molecules. Uh, we also attempted to conduct these trials uh, with our isolate from the R6 location, uh, but we had difficulty growing the microbe in a liquid broth or resuspending it from the plate into a liquid medium. Um, and those are you really need to do that. It needs to be a liquid medium that you suspend the syringes in order, um, the syringes in, in order for this assay to work. So that is why um, there is no R6 isolate in that graph. And then after we conducted the microchemotaxis assays, we extracted the DNA, um, the whole gDNA um, from our R6 isolate and amplified a very specific portion of the DNA um, using uh, PCR. So everyone has heard of PCR now, I'm sure, um, because of all the PCR tests for um, COVID. But actually, PCR is a very common molecular biology technique that we use all the time in our classes at Rollins, where um, you use specific primers that will then specifically amplify a very, very specific region of DNA um, and it really only takes theoretically one piece of DNA for it to then be amplified um, to the point where you can see it. So this gene encodes, um, so we, we did that for a portion, just a fragment of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And this gene in bacteria encodes for a functional ribosomal RNA that makes up part of the small subunit of the bacterial ribosome and it is very well conserved across species of bacteria. So the ribosome is of course the organelle in every cell that um, creates uh, proteins using amino acids. And it's actually composed of uh, proteins, but then also a large part of it is RNA. Um, so this gene specifically encoded for a piece of RNA that would then go on to assemble into a part of the bacterial ribosome. And its high level of conservation across bacterial species, um, it means that, the, that that bacteria belonging 
to the same or similar taxonomic groups will have essentially the same sequence of their 16S rRNA gene. And the sequence of the gene um, has been used in lieu of whole bacterial genomes um, to give you a better idea of what you're looking at. Um, so once we sent in the DNA for sequencing, a search through a database of sequences showed us that the R6 isolate from the surface of Copperman's painting had 98.76% sequence similarity with the 16S rRNA gene of Rhodopseudomonas renobacensis strain GR19. So on the left of this slide, you can see a scanning electron micrograph of a closely related bacterium, Rhodopseudomonas palustris. Thus, the R6 isolate and perhaps many of the other isolates, uh, but that was the only one that we had sequenced, um, it likely belongs to the genus Rhodopseudomonas, and it potentially represents an undescribed novel species. However, more investigations and a sequence of the entire genome will be required to tell for certain. Additionally, other bacteria in the genus Rhodopseudomonas require very specific growth conditions and usually a low oxygen environment. So this could potentially explain some of the issues that we were having with growing the microbe because of its potential identity as a microaerophile. So they, they require some oxygen in order to, um, to grow, but, they, but high levels of oxygen will actually inhibit their growth. In the future, I hope that I will have uh, the chance to come back and or collaborate with Rollins and further um, characterize some of those isolates. Uh, we have 11 of them um, and we only sequenced uh, the 16S rDNA for one of them. Uh, so there's definitely still work to be done there. And additionally, Dr. Pamela Branick will have students working on a project looking at the whole bacterial um, community and seeing how that differs with changes in hue or value of the location. Um, and that's actually uh, what I started working on my senior thesis. We continued this project and we were looking at using um, high throughput sequencing technologies to um, kind of give us a picture of the microbiome, not only of the painting, but of specific locations on the painting and then comparing those and seeing how they differ. Um, unfortunately, though, we did encounter, once again, problems um, growing the microbe in, um, in those various conditions that we tried. So we had to ultimately shift my, um, my project to a different topic. But that is still definitely, um, definitely up for grabs if somebody uh, wanted to look at this. And then um, finally, uh, ideally, this investigation should be verified with established methods of pigment identification. And this is just to confirm whether or not this painting um, actually contains cochineal as our study suggested. And I would like to thank Dr. Santiago for taking on this project with me, as well as um, thanking Dr. Branick for continuing this project in my honors degree program and honors in the major thesis. And then additionally, I would like to thank Dr. Susan Libby for being on my thesis committee and Dr. Patron for both being on my thesis committee and then also um, helping me to extract cinnabarone from dragon's blood resin. And of course, uh, thank you to uh, the Cornell Fine Arts Museum and its wonderful staff for letting me um, touch the painting with the, with the swabs. That was very nerve inducing for me, but um, I, I think that we, we really, we really did a lot of um, interdisciplinary research that could not have been done at other institutions. So I'm very thankful to Rollins and also CFAM for making that happen. And then um, finally, I would like to thank the Rollins College Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, um, and the Rollins College Honors De Degree Program, and the Rollins College Student Faculty Collaborative Scholarship Program for their um, ongoing support to this project. So uh, thank you, and we will now open the chat to questions. Well, thank you so much, um, Isaac, for that fascinating 
um, an in-depth presentation about the work that you have been doing under the supervision of our colleagues here at Rollins and Dr. Santiago. Uh, there are a couple of questions coming in in the comment box. Uh, before I go to those, um, I think one general question that uh, might help us get started is, you know, I know that you have had an interest in contemporary art and, and art that uh, is made of different types of materials. And we have a collection with thousands of works of art. So why your focus on this particular painting? And do you think, and this is a question that I think Anna brought up, um, is this the type of, of research and engagement that you'll be able to do once you get to the Netherlands, to your new master's program? Awesome. Yes, thank you, Anna, for that question. Uh, it's great to see you in the chat. But um, yes, yeah, so actually part of um, part of my studies in the Netherlands for the first year, I will be working on further uh, characterizing other microbes that they have. Um, so actually discovering a novel microbe isn't really isn't really that um, that crazy of a thing. And it's it's really crazy to think about. But when you um, any like study about soil bacteria, all of them bring back microbes that have never been described before. So uh, yes, I will be able to continue this type of work and specifically in, um, in characterizing uh, unknown microbes and then also uh, working on um, annotating their genomes with uh, genes of interest. And yes, and I, I can't wait to start that in the Netherlands. That's fantastic. And um, a follow up to that question is, so, um, for some, for some of us, you know, art historians or those of us who are not experts in microbiology or chemistry, can you tell us a little bit more what it means to, um, after you have tested this painting and examined some of its components, would you recommend that um, it be conserved? What type of treatment? You know, Anna was saying in the comment box, is this something that um, is, does it make it unstable as a work of art? Uh, or can we keep uh, showing it uh, in its current state? Yeah, so I think that's, all of those are great questions. And also I think it just goes into the ethics of conservation because specifically for this artwork, one of the reasons that we chose this was because, um, because of its kind of like less than, less than um, ideal state because then we knew that the, um, that the bacterial communities had likely never been disturbed on the surface of the painting. And also there's been research specifically on Polish, um, Polish textiles um, from around this time period or slightly later that shows that uh, the microbiome of objects and the microbiome of artworks in particular isn't just a reflection of their immediate surroundings or their recent past, they represent an accumulation of microbes over their entire existence as objects. So um, specifically for in the interest of research, I would say not to conserve this work um, because we are still you know, in the process of um, writing a, the, um, our article and getting that published. But um, ultimately um, oil paintings, they degrade more slowly than if this work were in particular like a textile or a contemporary artwork using um, more non-traditional materials. So I don't think that the conservation state of the CPAM painting necessarily makes it that unstable. Um, but if I were to recommend conservation treatments, um, what type of treatment? Actually, that Caselli and other authors in 2018, when they published their paper, looking at that, uh, at that painting by Carlo Benoni, they actually attempted to introduce species of bacteria to the painting, uh, bacteriostatic strains of bacillus. So that just means that they don't really grow, they just kind of sit there and take up space. Um, and that actually seemed to have some, um, some therapeutic benefit to the artworks. So um, rather than, you know, like aggressively like wiping it with um, solvents, uh, potentially there could be some introduction of some bacteriostatic um, strains that would then outcompete the more antagonistic microbes. That is so fascinating. And, and, you know, processing it from an art history perspective also is fascinating to think about 
how, you know, these things that we don't see with our naked eye when we see the painting uh, in the vault or on view in the exhibition gallery, that there's all there are all these things that are happening on the surface uh, of the work um, with the interaction of materials that that change the way that the painting may look or looks after, you know, uh, a number of years. Um, I have a question for Dr. Santiago. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about how this project and how uh, your involvement with this project and a work of art from our museum has impacted or maybe you think will impact your teaching going forward? Mm -hmm. uh, so thinking about from the arts now going into uh, science. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. You know, when I was an undergraduate student, even though my major was in biology, I was very interested in art. And in fact, I took all of my electives in art because I was always always fascinated by the topic. So having Isaac come to me with this idea was really a dream come true because even though I am a microbiologist, one of the things that I love about microbiome research is that you're applying microbiology to everything and anything. And I think artworks are so important, uh, not just historically, but the impact that they have in us. Uh, and understanding how to conserve them or how to preserve them for future generations is important. So specifically for me, I once we did this project, first of all, I lured a lot of students into my classes by telling them more about how CFAM is a great resource, not just for us to go see artwork, but to also do research. And I talked to them about the microbiome of things, and I used our project as an example for them to really understand that interdisciplinary research can be applied to everything and and our understanding of microbiology can be just as important for a physician and it can just be as important for someone who's into art conservation. So a project like this to me is the best way to show my students of how they can take what they learn at Rollins and apply it in the real world. Um, and again, the idea that the crazy idea of thinking, oh, I can introduce microbes to an ancient painting to conserve it might not be really logical in a way, but if we understand the role that microbes play, then we can kind of use them to our benefit, which I always think uh, is really fascinating. So, so yes, uh, to answer the question, I think it's had a really positive impact in my teaching, and it has actually opened uh, at least to my research and the ideas of things that I can do with my students on campus using the resources that we have uh, right there for them to, to see and touch and use. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And, and you know, going back to um, something that Isaac said before in response to um, one of NS questions, you know, now I'm thinking this would be a great argument for uh, against conserving the painting, right? Because now it has become a great case study to illustrate exactly this type of collaboration and 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 how to have this hands-on experience um, as as you both were describing earlier, uh, we have several other questions. Uh, thank you, Anne Hicksmura, for uh, for your words. She has a beautiful message for you, Isaac, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and then there are a couple of questions about the science um, from Susan, uh, Dr. Santiago. I don't know if you want to take those. Yeah, well, I can take the um, her first question. Sure. Yeah, go, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so she said, I noticed that your assays seem to test rod-shaped bacteria. At the microscopic level, were all of your isolates rod-shaped? So, um, yes, probably. Um, so I can't speak to uh, all of the isolates, but the R6 isolate uh, is likely in the genus Rhodopseudomonas, and they have that unique budding behavior. So that one image of um, Rhodopseudomonas palustris, that's a very textbook image of, of Rhodopseudomonas, and they do uh, bud off and they are rod shaped. Um, so yes, probably, but then also we didn't um, sequence the rest of them, so we could have also isolated something from another location, and it also grew, but it, it could be a different bacteria, but all of them exhibited um, some of the same growth characteristics, so we're assuming that they are rod shaped. Thanks. Thank you, Isaac. And there's another question here um, from Susan. And this this is uh, something that I'm curious about because I've heard 
this in other places, um, and then also the opposite. She says, I've heard saliva is a great way to clean paintings. Mm -hmm. How do you suppose that affects the microbiome of your paintings? Is it promoting degradation or conserving? And I have sometimes heard or read the opposite, right? That saliva can, can uh, affect a painting um, in a very negative way. And so that's why we, one of the reasons why we don't encourage people getting too close or talking too close to a work of art. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I I, I wasn't familiar with the idea of, of <laughs> the saliva with the paintings, but, but I do study oral microbiology and I'm very familiar with the components of saliva. So one of the things that comes to mind is that our saliva contains an enzyme called amylase, which is basically helps us degrade uh, starch and any other type of plant material that typically we don't have the ability to break down. So assuming that the materials used in these older paintings were plant-based like papers or coming from fibers from plants and things like that, I don't think having saliva on the painting would be good structurally. Uh, but from a microbial perspective, um, the microorganisms that we have in our mouth are kind of have evolved to live in our mouth and not necessarily live in other places. So even there could be transfer, obviously, of microbes from your saliva to the painting, but there's no guarantee that these microbes will be able to establish themselves and actually have a significant impact on what is already there. Uh, I think microbes that are on paintings for the most part, especially old paintings, uh, are might be dormant in the sense that they've used the nutrients and they're sort of in this dormant phase that we call sporulation, which means that they're kind of like in stasis waiting for the moment where more food is available for them to regrow. Um, and they're occupying a surface, right? So it's not as easy for another microbe to come in and take over unless the, the space has been opened up or provided for them to come in. Uh, I don't think oral microorganisms will easily colonize other places uh, because they've been sort of evolved to live in the mouth. Um, but by the chance that there is some sort of transfer, if they can colonize and if they can grow on the surface of the painting, then yes, hypothetically, they could have an impact on what is already there. If what is growing there is affected by the presence of these new neighbors, right? Microbes interact with each other in a number of ways. So it's difficult to predict what those interactions are gonna be like and how it can affect the community besides just the physical transfer, right? They were here and now they show up here, but it doesn't mean that they will be established there long-term. And that was one of the reasons that we originally um, selected mineral salt medium, because we originally also hypothesized that we would um, discover likely spore forming bacteria on, on the surface of the painting. And MSM was of course used in 2016 to isolate spore forming bacillus from paint warehouses. So we had an idea of what we were going to find, but then we just found something totally different. So. That's fantastic. Thank you for addressing uh, addressing that. Um, Isaac, specifically to you, mm -hmm. now that you have graduated, you're getting ready to go to the Netherlands and continue your, uh, your graduate program. Um, now that you look back at this process of interacting with this painting in a very literally hands-on way, right, in a way that um, some of us don't, um, because we focus on the history and how we, we use the work of art, uh, to help us tell a story in the galleries, et cetera. What is your biggest takeaway from, from this experience and this project? Yeah, definitely. I would just have to say that art informs science and science informs art. So actually I was in a class with, um, with Dr. Susan Walsh and uh, her husband, uh, Josh Almond, and it was called The Art and Science of Cell Death. And that, it was really, really interdisciplinary, really the thing that I came to Rollins to do was to do uh, this interdisciplinary research. And uh, I know that a lot of people, when I would tell them that I'm double majoring in biology, which was originally what I was going to do, and art history at my graduation party, they were like, okay, um, <laughs> but I did it. And also it's really working out well. So that's, that's my biggest takeaway is just that um, interdisciplinary research is extremely valuable. And, um, and you can look at, problems and questions that other people haven't really thought of and apply um, unique solutions, which is what I think this project was. That's fantastic. And, and we need more colleagues in the field with the level of knowledge and expertise that you are 
that you have been training for for the last four years and that now you're going to even more specialized training. And I can't wait to see you hopefully in our conservation lab when we have one in your white coat conserving maybe this painting, maybe another one. Um, so I want to thank all of you who joined us tonight and I want to remind you and Anna reminded us, yes, that this painting will be on view in an exhibition at the museum this fall. So if you're curious to come and take a look at the painting and, and look at some of the areas that Isaac and Dr. Santiago uh, talked about, when you see it, um, you will remember this talk, hopefully, and uh, and think about, uh, as Isaac was saying, the interdisciplinary connections and the uh, working collaboratively that we do here at Rollins. A work of art opens the doors to learn about a lot of things, and I love that with this project, faculty, student, um, and museum staff have been able to work together to look at this painting from a very different angle and a very different perspective and go more in depth. Thank you both so much for your expertise and for your research and your collaboration and for enriching the way in which we look at the works of art in our collection, particularly at this painting. Any final words, um, Isaac? Thank you everyone for showing up and thank you. I'm recognizing a lot of names in the chat. It's super nice. Yes, thank you everyone. We'll be cheering you on from our campus as you go on to your graduate studies and we wish you all the best. Thank you so much, Dr. Santiago, for your dedication to this project and for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me and thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about our work. And I hope uh, we get to collaborate uh, sometime very soon, maybe with another work of art in another project. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. For more information about what's on view at the museum and what's coming up next, visit us at rollins.edu CFAM. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you so much.